Right, we are recording. Okay. Okay. So, welcome to the second episode of the Rugby Code Breakers, featuring me, a self-confessed northern monkey, <laughs> and some guy from you know, Silver Spoon country. Uh, <laughs> It's Lawrence. Tired of drinking Southern soft tea, yeah. Yeah, and I am, of course, Martin. So they tell me. Yeah. And since we, get. since we uh, um, released our first episode just over a couple of weeks ago, we have had an awful lot of things happening in the world of rugby to talk about today. Uh, we've got World Cups galore going on. Um, We've had uh, got four rugby league World Cups of varying um, um, stripes taking place at the moment, and uh, of course the Women's Rugby Union World Cup, which is heading into the final stages now, uh, and getting very close to an England victory. I hope. <laughs> yeah, there may be some uh, people dressed in black as ever who will dispute that. Yeah. Just uh, possibly the uh, hosts may have a little something to say about it, but uh, yeah. but we shall see. Um, it's been uh, it's been a terrific performance by England through most of that um, tournament, and um, I think they really, you know, they they really have become a bit of a juggernaut. The England women's uh, rugby union side. <laughs> So much so they're starting to draw fire for it. Indeed. Forward, forward play, um, criticism being levelled at them as if they were 1980s England. Men. Yes. <laughs> it's difficult though, isn't it? Because if you're good at something, then you are going to make the most of it. Um, but on the other hand, as we all know, uh, rugby is um, entertainment. Uh, that's why the, why people pay to watch it is to enjoy themselves so if you're not doing that is why they always say that a, a match that finishes 6-3 is a game for the purists for some reason but yes the purists will like seeing um 30 people on a pitch um huddled together in the middle for a while yes yes apparently uh purist is synonymous for um it's just has a, an incredible boredom threshold <laughs> totally yeah, but um, I, I, as I say, I think it's a little bit harsh when you're in you're in knockout rugby. You um, you know you have to win in order to progress, and you know if you bring home the trophy, criticism of how en entertaining you were is going to be relatively muted. One would assume. So if you've got a huge advantage in the forwards, then yeah, why not rumble over people? <laughs> And knockout rugby is about the result rather than exactly. entertainment. I remember um, a few years ago when Sean Wayne was coaching Wigan, um, a lot of people used to criticise uh, the uh, Wigan for being uh, boring to watch. And I have to admit, as I was sat there counting our grand final appearances and victories as a Wigan fan, I really didn't care. <laughs> so I was entertained. <laughs> And you got you used to have sides in the union like the um, Gloucester sides of old. Uh, they used to pride themselves on up the jumper forward players. That was their the brand. Yeah, absolutely. And it can, I think it can be entertaining. Um, uh, done well. Um, I think yeah, that that purist thing is perhaps not entirely without merit. There is a, a little bit to say. Well. If you're relatively new to watching um, to watching rugby, maybe you won't uh, won't appreciate a team who, uh, you know, repeatedly mopping up their opponents in the line out. Whereas if, you, if you've been watching it for a few years, you think you, you notice when people are doing something well uh, and, you know, you can at least admire the skill involved, even if it's not as exciting as watching the ball go through hands 10 times. Uh, and in the men's game, it was certainly how Argentina um, set their mark in the international scene and got themselves into a, onto a level where they could have a be part of a regular tournament with 
Australia, South Africa and New Zealand. Yeah, definitely. I think that also applies to um, Italy in those early days of the Six Nations when, uh, you know, when Castro Giovanni and Lo Cicero were uh, the first choice props. And it was one of those where you, you thought, well, they couldn't necessarily match their opponents in every area, but their front row was always going to get them some ball and Diego Dominguez was always going to kick some points. So they were in games. <laughs> and then add Carice for a touch of world class. Indeed, yes. So I think that's one of the advantages that um, the rugby union has over rugby league in terms of competitiveness for smaller nations. There's different ways to play the game. Um, one of those um, ways is relying on a strong forward pack if you've got one. Another one is relying on a strong kicking game. You've got a few more options, whereas in rugby league, really all you can do when you have the ball is run forward with it and, and obviously pass. But because of the six tackle rule, you have to keep going forward. You turn the ball over um, eventually at the end of your six tackles. So you know you're going to lose possession at some point. All you can do is attack. And I think that makes it, you know, if you look at football, a team who are two or three divisions below another team can say, we're going to pack men behind the ball. We're, um, we're going to try and hit on the break and we might um, and we get something. That's great. And it can work. You can't do that in rugby league. You can't really do it in rugby union, but you've got a bit more option in rugby union well, than you have. I'm trying not to resort to national, national stereotyping to describe the Japanese at their best at this point. Uh, having um, beaten the, the then world champion South Africa in the World Cup uh, through relentless attacking, and having come close this weekend to doing the same to New Zealand. Um, the 38-31 scoreline apparently brought about by relentless attacking from the Japanese. Yeah, uh, that's, again, as you say, a different way of playing compared to some other teams. Um, so, um, you might criticise it as being tactically naive, but on the other hand, you, you can say, no, it's playing to their strengths. We know what it we're was, good at. It was also how the Fijians played for uh, for most of their history. Yeah. And what made them so great at the sevens. Indeed. Yes, absolutely. We, uh, we love a bit of sevens. And uh, Fiji were the ultimate exponents, uh, you know, one of the most entertaining uh, sites in world sport, I'd say, watching Fiji in their heyday of uh, sevens. When, when the likes of um, uh, Serevi in full flow. Yeah, they, indeed. Tremendous player. And uh, as it, it was a bit like, um, you know, watching uh, the Brazil football team of 1982 or something, you know, it was just this... Uh, joyful um, passage of, of constant attacking and uh, you know, people people who've obviously thought, I'm, I'm aware of this concept called defence. I, I may have heard of it, but I really don't see what relevance it has to, to what I'm doing. <laughs> then, yes, sorry, we'll just outshoot you. Easy. Yeah, yeah the, the uh, ultimate way of saying... We are going to win by scoring more points than you, not by conceding fewer. Mm. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's great, great strides for Japan anyway. As you say, that that victory over the Springboks was uh, was um, wonderful because it was in a World Cup. But the fact that it wasn't just a one off and that the, they've, you know, continued to get uh, to be competitive. Um, that that's uh, that's what it's all about for uh, developing smaller nations. There has been some talk of um, trying to get them into one of the major international series, but there appears to be confusion as to whether it would be the tri nations, sorry, or the four nations as it is now down in the, of the southern hemisphere, or with the um, European nations. Yeah, they're they're running out of room <laughs> in those championships. I think. Um, to expand as they are, um, I think geographically you'd think yeah they should go in the rugby championship with the uh, with, with the southern hemisphere nations. Um, but on I'm the other, be ridiculous. Yeah, indeed. But on the other hand, you think well, they've it's not that long since they switched to four. Um, it, 
and you start risking a, a real difficulty of fitting the fixtures in i think the more you expand these um the six nations could it stand to go up to seven i'm not sure it, it's already you know northern hemisphere rugby already has to deal the clubs will tell you they have to deal a lot with losing their um their top players to internationals they do it in the autumn internationals which are upon us right now um and then they do it again in the six nations um and uh, you think yeah i don't i don't think the idea of popping another team into the six nations and saying let's uh, let's draw it out another week or two would yeah. go down very well then again you could say maybe it's time to replace italy yeah that's a, a can of worms for not for possibly for another another time yeah uh, Yes, and there are because there are already teams that are knocking on the door and looking for that opportunity themselves. The likes of Georgia, Romania. Um, yeah, I mean uh, Romania can argue the fact that they didn't get it um, when it when Italy got that spot in the Six Nations uh, put the development of the game back a decade or more over uh, there. Um, the um, it's tough. It's tough. There are they all these nations need more opportunities for better competition, that will help them uh, develop. But there are there's a limit to how much more you can give. Um, Rugby union has a very very packed schedule already. Uh, lots of internationals and a thriving seven circuit, um, and a big club game. Yeah. Although uh, opponents of that theory of. Uh, um developing them by playing at the highest level will point to the lack of success from Italy. Yeah. The fact that they haven't kicked on. Yeah, it's true. You know, name one thing that the Italian Rugby League team have done that the Italian Rugby Union team have never done. I'm going to go with beating England. Exactly, yeah. Italy beat England in Rugby League in 2013, the England's warm-up match just before the World Cup of that year. Uh, nobody saw it coming. <laughs> Uh, as you said, it's never happened yet in uh, in rugby union after what twenty odd years of Six Nations participation. Not true. I can't remember if they've beaten the Irish. I know they've beaten the French and the Scottish and the Welsh. I'm pretty sure they have beaten the Irish at, at least once. Um, though hard though that would seem to believe in this day and age. Uh, I don't know. It's tough, isn't it? You think because. I think Italy probably have improved since they first entered the Six Nations. I just don't think they've improved as much as all the other nations in the Six Nations. Uh, I, I, you know, I think uh, the standard has kept going up. I don't think their standard has gone up quick enough to keep pace. I do think there are more homegrown Italians and um, grandparented um, players coming through as well. Yeah, which is, which has got to be a good thing. Um, I mean, heritage players are vital, I think, in establishing um, a lot of these inter these international teams. But they you can't rely on them forever. Um, if heritage play, that's the big problem that we're seeing in this Rugby League World Cup, I think, is the fact that We've got a lot of teams in there who are barely competitive and they're only barely competitive because of the amount of heritage players they've got. And that would be fine, except that for a lot of them, you think, well, that's where they were in the last World Cup and the World Cup before that and the World Cup before that. At what point do they break away from that and start producing uh, their own players? That's why Wales, who are being knocked out of the World Cup as we speak at the moment by Papua New Guinea, um, have been have taken the daring approach of saying, well, we're not going to rely on um, scouring Australia and Northern England for heritage players. They've got a squad of 24. Only one of them's a full-time professional, and but 12 of them were born in Wales, which, you know, you think... The last time that was probably true would have been back in like the 1995 World Cup, and that's only because there were a load of guys, uh, a load of rugby union imports in the team. How many of the Lebanese team are actually resident in Lebanon? Not that many. 
There are some though. There is a Lebanese comp competition, and I think that's one thing that some people are saying about about this World Cup. If it if it's to be a success in terms of developing those nations, there's a there's a, a case where we say the likes of Scotland. No disrespect to Scotland. I'd I'd love to see a successful Scottish rugby league side, but the fact is, again, we've been through multiple World Cups now, and it's still basically a heritage side. Um, whereas Jamaica and Greece have come into this tournament and been absolutely annihilated in their biggest games, but they've done it with a chunk of players from their own domestic competitions, um, which are which are really new, you know, you, and you've got to think well. Good for them. I think Jamaica brought six players out of their 24 from the Jamaican competition. Um, that, that's a big deal. And you think, and that's something to, to build on. They're, they're already, their coach is already talking about the fact that they're, um, as a result of this participation in this World Cup, they've got kids in Jamaica who are going to go to college on rugby league scholarships. Nice. So they're developing a pathway. And you think, well, good for them. I'm perfect. A lot of people have looked at the blowout score lines and said those teams shouldn't be in the World Cup. I'm thinking if you look at the history of all the World Cups, football, rugby union, everything, there's been huge blowout uh, get the score lines in all of them in the past. The difference oh. is they kicked on those countries. <laughs> How long ago was it that the Japanese got blown out by 100 points by New Zealand in the well, in the World Cup? And now they're 38-31. Yeah, exactly. The, the, I think that's the thing, isn't it? That there's been work done and they've, they've capitalised on the momentum of participating in World Cups. And, uh, you know, they've built on that. I think Greece are another team that look like they'll do that. And I think if you look at a team like Serbia, who keep, who've just missed out on qualification for the, for this World Cup, but... That's with an entirely homegrown team playing in the Serbian competition. Now, that is a long way away from the standard of Super League or, or you know, heaven forbid, the NRL in Australia. Um, to the extent that I remember a couple of years ago, Red Star um, came over and played in the Challenge Cup and they played one of e England's better known amateur sides in an early round of the Challenge Cup and they lost. And you think, oh, they're the champions of Serbia pretty much every year and they've lost to an amateur side. But it was a good game. And you think that's something to build on. Uh, put those teams in the World Cup. And I think maybe for the next World Cup in France in 2025, there's a case to say, you know, by no means forbid uh, teams from bringing heritage players, because as I say, they, they play an important role. I think the fact that um, those players from the Greek competition are playing alongside players who play at the highest level in Australia. It's great for them. They get to learn a whole new bunch of habits and see how it's done. But there probably should be a, a maximum quota of allowed yeah. heritage players or something. It, it, um, it would be very difficult because... Especially with World Cups where you get these sort of same effects as you get in football where uh, a player can shine in, a, in a, one of the minnow teams and potentially get picked up by a club side from a larger nation and get developed by that club and then come back bringing what he knows to his national team and showing yes. and also showing his teammates that there is a way to progress. Yeah, yeah. Tomorrow, the Women's Rugby League World, uh, World Cup kicks off. Brazil are going to play England and that'll be the first time a South American team has taken part in a Rugby League World Cup. And you've got to be realistic and say, Brazil are probably going to get absolutely mullered tomorrow night. But, again, they're bringing homegrown players. They've got players in Brazil who travel over a thousand miles on a bus to play a game of rugby league in their own competition. And those women are already talking about the, the possibility of finding clubs in England to play for, in the Women's National Rugby League in Australia to play for. They'll put themselves in the shop window and, you know, one or two of them will will probably get picked up and get that opportunity to make the move, learn to play at a high level. And then, as you say, take that back to their to their own country and internationals. Um, that would be invaluable. The other thing with heritage players in, in World Cups, of course, is because of that 
and we talked about this briefly in the last show, because there are so few internationals in rugby league, what you get is players who put their hand up for Scotland or Ireland or someone like that in a World Cup cycle. Um, Australian players who know they're never ever, you know, they're decent players, but they're never ever going to play for their national side. Um, And then for the four years after that World Cup, they're nowhere to be found when Scotland and Ireland are trying to go through qualifying matches in European Championship matches. Uh, they, start, they start claiming because they're in Australia, so too far to come for, for matches. Yeah, you get the odd exception. I remember there was a, 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 um, a Scottish uh, international from Australia a few years ago who paid his own airfare to come and represent Scotland in a, in a qualifying match. Um, over uh, that was in that was taking place in Scotland. And you think those are the kind of heritage players you want, the ones who are who are going to do the thankless task to come and play in the games with three hundred people watching, uh, and as you say, play alongside the players from the domestic competitions, which are all amateur, and say to those guys, "I can show you a few a, a thing or two that you can take back to your amateur club." There we go. We've set the world to rights there. <laughs> um, I suppose we can we can segue from Scotland into the um, into the autumn internationals as well. Yeah, absolutely. Scotland. I mean, there's a place to start. As a Scotland supporter, I guess it shows the development of the Scottish side that we're disappointed not to beat Australia at home. Yeah, it would have been the fourth win in a row over the Wallabies. Home and away, yes. Yeah, which, you know, you go back a few years and you wouldn't really imagine that possible. Uh. And I missed penalty in the in the dying moments of the game um, to give the game away um, as a result of the indiscipline of the side, from what I gather. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And we've heard, of course, there are questions being asked over Finn Russell. Was he available to play? If he was, why wasn't he playing? He kicked nine goals out of ten attempts at the weekend. Um, but I always think it's very, very hard to judge. Just because he was having a good game playing for his club doesn't mean, you know, Blair Kinghorn was having a good game playing for Scotland. He just missed a crucial penalty. But you think if he wasn't playing, would they have been in the good position in the first place? Yeah. Uh, if you can have him in the side, do you pick Russell, especially with Hog absent as well? Yes, that's, that's the two, other question. Two of your major playmakers are, are missing at that point. Yeah. Right. Uh, King, Blair Kinghorn is a is a good 10, but does he have the game-breaking abilities of uh, Finn Russell? Potentially not, I, I'd say. Indeed. I suppose they're going to have... They've got, um, what, three more internationals in this autumn cycle to uh, work through some combinations. And... Uh, uh, and come to some conclusions, but it, it was a missed opportunity. Uh, against an Australia side, to be fair, probably not um, featuring their strongest possible lineup as well. I have to uh, check into their health of Hastings as well to see if see if there's a particular reason why he's not an option. Mm. Having pretty much displaced Russell on Merrick in the last couple of seasons. Another thing to note about that particular autumn international, of course, though, we we talk about being the code breakers and crossing codes. No one is doing that more than the Wallabies coach, Michael Chaker, who, of course, is coaching the Wallabies through an autumn international se- um, um, season at the same time as coaching Lebanon in the Rugby League World Cup. So this weekend, he's going to coach Lebanon on Thursday night, I think it is, in a quarterfinal of the World Cup against Australia. And two days later, he's going to coach Australia in Rugby Union against England. Uh, He says, uh, we're making it work somehow. But I've got to say, that's got to be totally unprecedented. Certainly getting the miles in anyway. Yeah. Indeed, and and he's doing that contending with all sorts with the Lebanon team. They've had a couple of break-ins at their hotel, um, um, a laptop stolen, uh, someone wandering into the uh, um, into the uh, players' room. It's 
that have he said you know uh, they they say we're a part time team it seems right now we're part time rugby players and part time security uh, <laughs> staff. Um, you, I'm not sure I'd want to steal much from a rugby player. No, I would suggest maybe if you are going to break into someone's uh, hotel room to steal, uh, the, the hotel of a twenty of 24 rugby players is perhaps not the smartest place to start. <laughs> uh, but Lebanon, they're a good example, as we said, of uh, that sort of, that mixture of uh, heritage players, because there's a lot of people of Lebanese heritage in, in Australia, especially around Sydney, and homegrown players. Um, and hopefully their continued success is going to keep um, inspiring the, the growth of the game in Lebanon, because this is the second pretty good World Cup they've had. You've got to assume, um, I'd love to see a fairy tale, but you've got to assume that they're going to get knocked out by the kangaroos uh, no, they've reached the knockout stage. But again, they reached the knockout stage. Yeah. And they put up a good showing against New Zealand um, in their toughest match. So, so um, the, Are the uh, Kiwis currently the number one side in the world, or is it still Australia? No, no, it's true. Uh, the Kiwis are the number one ranked side in the world. Um, it's a little bit slanted by the fact that Australia just haven't played very many games uh, over the last few years. Uh, I think um, since the 2017 World Cup, partly because of COVID, but of course COVID's affected everybody, not just Australia. Um, they've they've barely played a game at all. Uh, they've played a couple against New Zealand. They've played Tonga. Um, that's pretty much it, to be honest. So they just haven't had the opportunity to rack up ranking points. I can remember the time, though, when uh, New Zealand were third rated in, in the world, potentially fourth on a par with Wales and Ireland. Yeah. And now, again, the game is developing as they get more exposure. It's true. It's true. And, uh, and you know, going into this World Cup, a lot of people, regardless of world rankings, a lot of people still had New Zealand as their favourites to win this World Cup. Um, and it's likely that they're going to meet Australia in the semi final. Uh, you know, that would be quite something. But I think this Lebanon game will be an interesting one. We'll see, as I say, Lebanon gave New Zealand stiff resistance, but that was the opening game of the of the tournament, and it looks like all the big nations, um, Tonga, Australia, New Zealand, they all hit their straps really in the second game. A um, little bit of ring rust to, wear, to run out. Yeah, it could well be. So, if Australia put Lebanon to the sword, though, which New Zealand, you know, they they won comfortably enough in the end, but they had to work for it. I think that that will be a sort of little psychological tick in the box for for the Aussies to say, uh, you know, we're we're operating at a higher level. Um, Do the minnows in the rugby league games get the same issue that you certainly used to see a lot in the union teams, where there'd be competitive for 60 minutes and played badly then totally totally we've had good examples of that I, Papua New Guinea took Tonga right to the death uh, Tonga won that in the 79th minute uh, Wales of course put up a really good shout against the Cook Islands and it was one of those classic examples um, as I said, Wales played a really good first half but they were fading towards half time and, uh, Cook, and the Cook Islands were coming into it and they got the halftime break. They came out strong again at the beginning of the second half. But by the, the 60th minute, I think it was uh, Brian Noble in the commentary was saying this game's got heartbreak written all over it. And that's how it went, ended up. One uh, one try decided it. Danny Badiris, the former Australia hooker who played for Leeds Rhinos a few years back as well, he said that he really wanted to see more nines played at international level for exactly that reason. He said, you see so many teams who can be competitive for about 20 minutes or 30 minutes and then but they can't sustain it for the 80 and the short format of nines might mean that we'd get more uh, uh, a more competitive tournament with more upsets um interesting and again with the development of the full strength game the seven series that, that they've had in rugby union has has been a 
really useful development game, bringing players through into the top tiers, um, but giving them the experience of traveling with a, an international team, going around the world, playing in front of crowds. Yeah. Yeah, I love the Seven Circuit. It, it, it's the the World Sevens series is a, is a fantastic um, tournament, and I really think that uh, it's like everything that they do in rugby league. Everything is always hampered by being um, no follow through. You know, you try it. And maybe it's successful and maybe it's not. But after a couple of years, you've given up on it and moved on to something else. Uh, so, you know, we had a, a World Sevens back in, like, I think it was 1992. It was a club one, but it was a big tournament in Australia and it was quite successful. But we didn't do it again um, for another seven years or something. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, we've had the Auckland Nines um a couple of years ago that ran for a couple of years was very successful it was a pre-season tournament for the nrl teams um and again like oh we'll we'll drop it we had a world nines uh, back in 2018 i think it was again we've not bothered since uh, it, was, it was entertaining seeing wigan playing in the middlesex sevens yeah yeah i think that's one that we'll perhaps have to discuss um in more depth in a future episode because that was of course the the classic clash of the codes year you know, 1996 but it, it was it, that was a lot of fun and it was the nearest you could get to uh rugby league and rugby union teams being able to play each other on a, a level-ish playing field <laughs> because the, the truth is as we know and as as we've seen in the few attempts to do cross codes it is not possible for a rugby league team to beat a rugby union team at rugby union or vice versa. It yeah. can't happen. The games are too different. Yeah. There's always going to be the technicalities that are just insurmountable. Yeah. Brought the finer point where in, 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 when you have two games that are decided by the finer details, you can't. No. They've diverged a lot over the century and a bit that they've been split up. And it's it's a long time since we go back to Billy Boston crossing from Rugby Union to Rugby League in the 50s and literally learning to play the ball on the plane as he flew out to play for Great Britain. Um, and it's even longer since you go back to World War II and the very first cross-codes matches played in, in the army where... I think the rugby league side won both, but they were both like I think I can't remember it was something like eighteen twelve and fifteen eleven or something. In the t the two the two games were close anyway. Is is the point? They, they were clearly able to compete with each other under each other's rules, um, but they've diverged so much since then. Um, yeah. We saw in the uh, there was one a few years I say a few years ago. It was probably getting on for twenty years ago. Uh, St. Helens played Sale, one half of Rugby Union and one half of Rugby League. I think Sale won 41-39 and scored 41 point unanswered points in the Rugby Union half and, and Saints scored 39 unanswered points in the Rugby League half of the game. It's <laughs> So I'm um, guessing Sale basically won on the scoring methods. Yeah, probably. Um, and that really illustrates Jerry Guscott's point, of course. He copped a bit of flack from some people for not playing for Bath in the Clash of Codes. But I think he, being a professional, or not officially professional, uh, rugby union player at the time, but, yeah. uh, you know, a, a test player, uh, he knew that this was that this was not going to be a meaningful contest. I still think at the time it was worth doing because I think there were a lot of fans on both sides of the fence there who didn't understand the the difference and didn't really have any respect for the other code because you know they 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 were so convinced that they were watching the superior code they thought this was going to be a walk in the park and then they found out no actually as you say the games are too different there are too many different technicalities that you cannot possibly um, expect to master in a couple of training sessions. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to discuss um, cross-code games and players at, at a later date. I think yeah. there's, there's a fair bit of mileage in there. Yeah, 
perhaps we can do a top 10 of, of cross code players or something yeah. going but um in both directions and see if we can we'll see if we can avoid getting jonathan davis top of both lists <laughs> yes yeah it might take some doing but uh I think, uh, as you say, there's a lot of mileage in that. And it was always a lot of fun to speculate about players who could have made the the, uh, the, the trip but never did for whatever reason. Uh, yeah. We have to give that some brain power, but there's definitely mileage in there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think um, before we go much further, I just have to say, though, as well, congratulations to the England Physical Disability Rugby League team who won the very first Physical Disability Rugby League World Cup this weekend. It's, uh, you know, really in its infancy. Four teams, England, Wales, Australia and New Zealand, uh, made up this little tournament. Uh, they got covered on the BBC. So uh, an entirely new form of, uh, of of the sport for people to watch. And they put on quite a show. Um, it's quite impressive watching someone with one arm catch a rugby ball and, and immediately go weaving his way through um, through an opposition at high speed. Uh, the the skill level on display was quite impressive, and uh, you know, and it's an English World Cup win. So, what's not to like? Yeah, let's see uh, how many of the um, different World Cups you boys can hold at once. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think you know. Uh, I, I'd, on previous um, previous World Cups and heartbreaks that I've, I've endured over the years, I'm, I'm just happy to take that one for the moment, and we'll see if any more if any more come come my way. That's great. But it's nice to know that the the, the Kiwis can share. Yes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, a wonderful achievement, and. Of course, as I said, Adam Hills was probably the highest high profile person involved in this. Actually scored a try for Australia in the third place playoff game against Wales. So right. he's got to be very happy about that. But as he said, what we've got to hope is that physical disability um, World Cup happens again in France in 2025 and then again in 2029, wherever that World Cup will be held. And by then, hopefully it'll be bedded in and it'll be you know, uh, just a fixture uh, of of the uh, tournament and not, as I say, what Rugby League has done so many times in the past. They're like, oh, that was a lot of fun. That was a good idea. Let's not bother with it again. Yeah. yeah I don't know. Yeah, um, certainly with Rugby League, it, I really think it needs to commit to its internationals more in every facet. Yeah. I We've got that IMG um, sports marketing group looking at the, the game. They, they've issued their recommendations, and that was one of the big ones. More internationals with a regular calendar. Uh, yeah, regular cal- calendar, and make sure that it's got the kudos. That means players will not want to play for their clubs instead. Yes. But do you mind we've got a cup match? It's not the attitude you want from your from your players, really, is it? No, it's not. Um, it's difficult with the finances of the game. If, if you have to ask clubs to sacrifice a week or two uh, um, and say, well, we just can't afford to do without the income from another home match. I understand that. But if you want to grow the game, <laughs> you have to do it. We have to have those international games. Um, and If you grow the international game, um, you end up with, a system where the international game can support your clubs. Yeah, hopefully it cascades down and benefits everybody in the game. I do wonder if the if the clubs don't want to give up that power, though. I don't know. It's entirely possible. It's entirely possible. I think there is definitely a situation by, uh, whereby the clubs do seem to have all the power. Um, but I wonder if I get the impression with the way that the clubs voted on the IMG recommendations that maybe a tipping point has been reached where uh, enough people in enough of the clubs are thinking, as Jason Robinson was saying the other day, you can't keep doing the same things. If they're not working, you have to change. And this might be the best opportunity rugby league has had to change. 
but change it properly, not inst not tinkering with something every sing every year or two, so that you know you don't see if something's had a chance to work before you've already changed it and done something else. So uh, commit to a plan and stick to it. And you know, to be honest, some of the fans will just be grateful for a bit of continuity. Potentially, uh, as well, if you've got to, you've got to give things time to bed in, you've got to give things these times to the time to establish themselves in people's uh, consciousness and then from that point of stability you can plan long term and the other thing is when you make the plan define the time frame um, from the outset yeah. yeah define what success looks like and make it realistic we've seen a lot of criticism of the crowds in the in the rugby league world cup uh, this time round, fair enough. Some of the tickets have probably been priced too high, but the fact is, people are comparing these internationals to football, to rugby union, to cricket, to games that, frankly, have a much much greater tradition of international competition and much more continuity of it. I my personal argument is. If we get 6,000 people watching New Zealand play Lebanon in a group match, that's not necessarily a bad result. It should be compared against what we, what did we get for a similar game in the last World Cup? We shouldn't be worrying about saying, well, if it was Rugby Union, they'd get 40,000 watching that. Um, I think, don't think they would, by the way. They'd probably get more like 25,000 or something. Um but you know, you know what I mean. People, people are aiming up too high there. It's like, yes, that's where we want to get to, but we don't have to get there in one go. Uh, they want incremental to growth. They just they want to jump straight to filling Wembley. Yeah, this is the issue we've had with Toronto. Um, uh, you know, it's that sort of magic bullet solution of oh, we can just parachute a team into another in, into a, a big city and. Everyone will come and watch it and it'll make loads of money immediately and it'll all be wonderful. Um, and two year, two or three years later, the club's gone. And uh, because that was never practical, um, it was not a bad idea. There was no reason why you couldn't make Toronto Wolfpack work if you had a realistic plan for it. Um, instead of saying, we'll be winning Super League in three years. Um, Catalans have worked because there was already tradition of rugby league in the south of France and they built on that um, instead of just, whereas, of course, we remember the early days of Super League, the very first, se first season of Super League, Paris Saint-Germain. They say, we'll have a French team, we'll have Paris. Paris don't, there is no tradition of rugby league in Paris. We don't care. People have heard of it. Let's put a team there. Yep. Two years later, it's gone. Given how they struggle to establish a team in London, you think they're known that? Yeah. But they keep looking for it. They keep looking for these magic bullet quick fix solutions, um, which are not really ever going to happen. Yeah. Mind you, I suspect that the um, London franchise was another thing that they never really quite fully committed to either. Well, as we know, it's gone through a lot of different changes. It was Fulham, then it was London Broncos, London, uh, sorry, London Crusaders, London Broncos, Queen's Rugby League, London Broncos again, played it about I don't know, probably 10 different stadiums over the years now. Most um, of which were too big. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't the first attempt. You know, they'd, they'd been trying rugby league teams in London back in the 30s. Uh, and they had, you know, but not sustained. I think London Broncos have probably done, again, if, if we defined what success looked like back when Fulham started, we might have said, actually, success would be still having this London team in 40 years' time and maybe having a couple more. And if we look at it from that perspective, like, yes, we've done that. We've still got London Broncos. They're not in the top flight, but they're in the second tier. We've got London Scholars in, in the tier below. And we've got London and the South East born players playing at the absolute highest level. You know, we've, we've had England capped players who come from... Tony Club from uh, Gillingham, uh, Louis McCarthy Scarsbrook from Millwall, Kai Pierce Paul in the England squad at the moment. Um, so, again, we might have said that would be success. 
if we could do it because there was no possible chance before the 1980s of uh, of a uh, a rugby league England international coming from London, unless it was a rugby union convert. Mm. Yeah. So I think um, moving cities now it does sort of segue us then into the fate of the Wasp side after they moved to Coventry. There's, um, which yeah, so much debt they have folded. Yes, but some promising news. Yeah, apparently yeah. they've well. They've found a buyer and that's been approved, but it's one of those watch the small print because that buyer is basically just for the Wasps men's team. Um, and I think the uh, possibly the youth team, but the, the women's team, team are and not. The, and the academy. The yeah. women's rugby and netball teams are not part of the deal. No, and nor is the Coventry Stadium. Uh, yeah. So they're still going to have to find somewhere to play. And hopefully find a future for the netball team and the women's uh, rugby team. Mm. Um, I hope they can, and I don't see necessarily why that why they can't do that. But uh, but this is of course, if the sale goes through, there are still 167 redundant players and staff. Yes, and there's still fit and proper tests to go through for the new owners. Um, they the it's a consortium of was in. Involving wasp legends, from what I gather. Yes, apparently so. Um, I know the chairman of Gloucester has, re- has recently been saying that he just wants to see more financial transparency in the game, um, and he's speaking in terms of you know being one of the better run um, teams financially. They posted a profit of a million pounds, uh, which most rugby teams would give their eye teeth to be able to say. But even then, they've got. 11 million pounds of government loans that will need to be paid back at some point uh that's it's hanging over that a lot of clubs the pandemic yeah exactly it's hanging over a lot of clubs um but as he said transparency um of the kind he's describing where people know how much money is going in and out of clubs um might have allowed people to head off what had happened to worcester three years before in his words and yeah. five years before in wasp's case uh, and as a bot supporter it does kind of make me concerned as well for what happens if the sugar daddy gets bored gets frustrated that, with the lack of results yeah that is a big thing isn't it it's uh how reliant a lot of clubs are on one or two people's generosity and uh if that changes as you say what happens um it, it's uh it's a big worry for uh, for fans and for players, obviously. Um, at a lot of clubs, and there must be a lot of very nervous players thinking, well, I've just assumed up to now that my wages will be paid, but maybe there'll come a time when they won't be paid. I don't know. And some of the players as well have been uh, relatively high profile. Um, I was, I think uh, I mentioned just before we came on air, there's... Uh, a uh, chap called Jack Willis, uh, who plays for Wasps. He's supposed to be um, featuring for England in the Autumn International Series, and he finds himself without a club, without security, and without and with his career up in the air. But yeah. Why the shop window if he gets if he's able to play? And yeah, not everyone well, is that and, lucky. And he, yeah, I, he'll need to play, as you say, to have that shop window because. Um, you can lose that momentum very, very quickly in your career. Um, he could miss that opportunity and find himself within 12 to 18 months, he's just former England international, and that's that. You know, it's gone. <laughs> Nearly made it, but I couldn't play because, yeah, because of what happened. I mean, guess you hear of sportsmen who are unable to play because they are not in the right headspace to do so and the, the amount of insecurity and pressure that will he'll be putting on himself for this series will be immense yes definitely definitely and the i think that uh, mental health side of things is another thing that we're gonna probably look into more deeply in a, in a future episode because that is relatively new, I think, to professional sport as a concept. We've heard of sports psychologists for years and everything, but 
but I think generally it's uh, Actually, you know the mental health that. conversation around society as a whole has changed so much mm. um, and there's no reason why players should be any different to any other people um, in terms of dealing with pressures uh, and pressures sometimes that are uh, hard to imagine if you're not part of it I'm sure yeah so I think because we're we're really running up towards the uh, the end of our uh, time, time slot. Yeah, it's time to open up the jukebox and have a look at another <laughs> hit. Excellent. Looking forward to this. So I'm just going to share my screen. And fire it up. And if it'll it'll play ball let's try this one uh -huh. hit of the week watch oh. this in, in slow motion <laughs> this is a prop forward <laughs> catching the ball oh. and being caught by a scrum half that was the scrum half hidden him? Yep. He certainly felt that one. I mean, it's no wonder they called Tommy Luluai the hardest shoulder in rugby league. And that's got him right up under the ribs. And to be fair, Murray Fasavalu would not be thanking anyone for that pass he got just <laughs> before that tackle. <laughs> arms, up, arms up and out ahead of him. Rib cage exposed, shorter guy yeah. coming straight in. He's feeling that before he's even hit the ground as well. Yeah, as Eddie, um, as Eddie Hemming said, that's cruel. But uh, I think um, it's one of my favourite tackles of all time. I mean, it, Wigan, a Wigan v Saints match as well, of course. Um, oh. So it's just especially perfect in that regard. Um, I think uh, Thomas Lulawai became uh -huh. famous for these uh, for these huge tackles uh, throughout his uh, career. Um, he just retired. He was the oldest player in uh, Super League at 37 this season. And somebody, the first comment I saw on his retirement was someone saying, well, Murray Fassavalu can sleep easier now. <laughs> yeah, I just really hope that Louis Lai had the right song chanted from, in from the stands. <laughs> yeah, and you know what, how we signed off, though, uh, this season? He captained New Zealand in their warm-up game against uh, for this World Cup against Leeds Rhinos. So his, his very last match was captaining his country. Um, many years after he'd become the youngest player ever to play for New Zealand Warriors in Australia and after a fantastic career over in England first for London Broncos and then mostly for my uh, my own favourites the Wigan Warriors uh, where he won pretty much everything there is to win uh, but that tackle is even by his own standards that's a that's a perler nice and from Big hits, we go to great tries. And this one is one that I think almost everybody has already seen. And I know you and I have seen it many times. But it won't hurt to watch it again a few more times. No. Here we go. We're going all the way back to 1973. When men had sidebar. Yeah. <laughs> there must be some high drag on those sideburn. <laughs> Here come the All Blacks. The all conquering All Blacks. And you... 
you know, this back then, 1973, this is the time when the All Blacks were establishing that legend that, as, that lives on to this day of, you know, the, the greatest um, international rugby that union had, team. So this tour that had the first All Black ever sent off, and then he went off to live in shame in the in the Australian outback, <laughs> and basically left society because of the ignominy of being the first all black sent off. It's uh, it's hard to remember sometimes just how uh, how much people took um, red cards to heart in sport in days gone by. Something you really had to earn, and yes. Oh, um, sorry to say that is really not not, that, not polite. <laughs> that's a high tackle in anyone's book, really, isn't it? He fetched him good and proper. Yeah. Oh. Made him miss. And again, let's go for they can't run without their heads. But yeah. apparently they can still offload without their heads. Perfect time in the offload. No one's going to say anything about a hint forward there, are they? And there we go. A try, I think, that no one who's ever seen it can ever forget. And it's one of those sort of things where you have to have to wonder how it how it played up north as well. Whether it yeah, has any definitely. impact in, in the psyche of the of the league fans. Absolutely wonderful. Um, it's the complete try, isn't it? <laughs> it's got a you know great side steps, beating men, picking out passes, all the the move almost breaking down, a dodgy high tackle or, uh, attempt or two thrown in by the by the despairing defence, and then a. Uh, a fast dash for the line at the end. Yeah. Um, people to someone faster than me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. People argue to this day about who the greatest uh, player um, is, of course, and they always will. But Gareth Edwards splits the northern and southern hemisphere like few other players. I think if you if you go for any top five or top ten list of the greatest rugby union players of all time, you can guarantee that any rugby union northern hemisphere fan of a certain certain vintage is putting Gareth Edwards at or near the top of that list. And in the southern hemisphere, maybe he's not making the list at all. It is it's. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it's it's understandable, I suppose. But uh, yeah, for uh, for as I say, for for Northern Hemisphere fans, it, he has a status that you know, will will uh, will not be easily eclipsed by anybody. And and that try is, you know, it was called on that video the greatest try. Um, Again, I don't think you can necessarily pick out just one try as the greatest ever. But if you had to, you could you could do a lot worse than picking that one. Yeah. Does rugby league have a an equivalent in terms of the resonance of that of that try? I can't think of one individual one that has quite that cachet. I think I can think of a few. That that do have a sort of special, um, special resonance where people will, as they'll remember the the commentary, they remember um, 
we're, there's a couple that I'm sure we'll look at in uh, episodes to come. But I don't think there's a single try that. I mean that that try for me that that encapsulates the best of rugby union. Where in in terms of the open game, that that's as good as it gets. And you know it's nearly fifty years old, but still, there are times sometimes in sport where you can show someone something from decades ago, and they won't quite appreciate it if they're a modern fan because the game has moved on, and they see the the frailties of the game that people didn't notice at the time that would be exposed by a more modern. I I can remember showing a, a, a football fr- a fan I know the Brazil team of 1982. Um, and while he could see that they were they were skillful, what he couldn't help but dwell on was how bad the defences were that they were up against compared to the modern day football. That is an exception. I think, you know, you could have shown that to someone in the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, the 2010s or now, and probably for another 10, 20, 30 years to come in the future, and people would always appreciate what a great try that was yeah i suppose part of the difference as well is that that was um that's the equivalent of a great goal scored against that brazil side rather than by that brazil side true as we as as we say that's the all blacks at the time then when they were building a legend that you know their, their name was intimidating it's like you're playing the all blacks you've lost before you start um uh, and uh yeah, that that was um, saying. You know what? Not only can we compete with them, we can beat them at their own game. We can score a try that they would be proud of. Yeah, wonderful. And I think that's probably as good a note as we can possibly find to wrap this episode up. I think so. So, uh, yeah, we'll we'll be back in a couple of weeks. And by then, we will have had the quarterfinals um, and probably the semi-finals of the Men's Rugby League World Cup, and we will be uh, we'll be previewing a final and what we hope will be an an England victory on home soil and a, an England vi- a British victory in the Rugby League World Cup for the first time since 1972 when Great Britain uh, beat Australia. Uh, and we can see how Michael Checker's sideline goes as well. Indeed. Can how how long can he keep up uh, coaching two elite sports teams in two different sports at the same time? Um, I take my hat off to him. <laughs> Definitely. On yeah. that note, I will wish you a fun farewell. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Take care. Right. Thank you very much. I haven't finished recording, but I'll just edit the ending off as usual. There we go.